Okay, so uh, um, basically the idea, uh, what, what I'm seeing is that the government is, is wanting to push through all of these changes and partially or to a large extent it's predicated on the um, use of electric uh, vehicles. Uh, but we've already had uh, some uh, some blackouts and I can't really see for the life of me how they're going to be able to produce the electricity uh, needed to uh, to fuel a whole fleet of electric vehicles. And I'm just wondering how you see that and how you see the electricity market in 2022. Okay. Well, I believe that uh, the plan is, government is strongly supporting the plan to nearly double our electricity generation capacity. Double? Yeah, uh, somewhere between two-thirds and two-thirds again as much generating capacity and up to twice the generating capacity. And how do you think that they are going to do that? by charging residential consumers higher and higher power bills and subsidizing the ones that are not related to actually providing new kilowatt hours. I think government is happy to subsidize Lake Onslow, which does nothing more than act as a battery, not provide new power. Yeah, right. And uh, the rest, I think that they just believe that consumers can pay more and more higher and higher power bills. Yeah. That's what the industry wants. And government wants it because government is 50% or 51% owner in most of the power stations which means that the government's own asset values will increase with those of the corporates. Yeah, yeah. Government is right behind that. Yeah. And, and it, uh, if you think it's crazy, it's happening elsewhere in the world. Yes, of course we're it not is. A, we're not alone in this ridiculous. Well, we don't we don't really make things up, do we? We follow. No, we follow. And so I believe the belief that we can build half again as many to twice double or two thirds again as much and up to double as much generating capacity, I believe we can't do it. No, well, it I won't mean, happen. I mean, what's, what's that going to be based on? Uh, you know, hydro, burning no. coal. Uh, wind power? Wind and solar, they Wind say. and solar. Wind, it's about 6% of the mix. Exactly, mixture. exactly. And <clears throat> unfortunately, it takes a lot of fossil fuels to build new wind and solar plant. Yes, and, and they don't last more. forever either. Exactly. And so they'll have to be renewed after 20 to 40 years, and 40 years isn't that far away. No, 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 no. And uh, the attempt to keep on growing, which is known politically as green growth, yeah. is a fraud. Of course it's a fraud. A total fraud. Fraud, yes. Yep. So, and I am happy to be quoted anywhere and everywhere as saying that. Yes. It is a fraud, and there is only one way to keep some society working after however many years this fraud is able to continue before people see through it. Yeah, right. And that way will be energy conservation. Yeah, yeah. As we know. Nobody talks about conservation, do they? That's right. And, because and, and conservation... You said something, and you said something interesting about the uh, the uh, industry leaders and their attitudes. Because I haven't seen any uh, talk about energy conservation for 20 years. Of course. It's off the agenda. And uh, ECA argues that... Uh, energy conservation is subject to what they call the Jevons paragraph, oh, yes, paradox, yes, yes. 
where the more you conserve, the more money you have to spend on something else. Yeah, yeah, right. And therefore, energy conservation cannot help us. Yeah. Well, things will happen until they don't. Yeah, well, that's right. <laughs> I think that the uh, the principle is uh, of infinite infinite growth, and let's le- let's uh, use the um, the climate crisis to promote more and more growth. Exactly, and that is what the IPCC continues to argue. But remember, the IPCC is a club of mainly rich nations yes. of and a, and a whole lot of underdeveloped nations that have no intellectual representation. Yes. They cannot represent what they think the world is doing because everything is dominated by the corporate agendas. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So the IPCC is not too different from the world energy conference which sorry the world economic conference yeah. uh, which is the oh you mean the world economic forum forum yes, yes. which is the regular meeting in davos yeah. which is uh represented primarily by corporate heads who together control a very high proportion, maybe 80 or 90 percent, of the asset value yeah. of, you know, of the big countries. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. So all these business meetings, and the WEF is the worst, but the IPPC is getting on to as bad. Yeah. They only represent business. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah. that's From right. From small consumers... The environment is represented by a handful of people who somehow get funded to go. And small consumers don't even exist. Yes, yes. And we have a situation really where, um, uh, oh, how's I going to put this? Uh, 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 I've lost the point. Okay, <laughs> yeah. okay. So uh, my position on growth is considered too radical yes. to be discussed in polite circles. Yes. There is a group called Degrowth Greens, yes. which I do contribute to, and the most radical of the papers that they promote are exactly the papers that I believe are correct. Yes, yes, yes. One of the groups, there are several international groups who promote true degrowth de- de- ideas. One is Ted Trainer of the Simplicity Institute. Uh, Ted Trainer. Ted Trainer, the Simplicity yeah. Institute. Okay. And you can find any of his papers by Googling them. Yeah. I believe other... Uh, somebody called Nate Hagens... Yes is even more extreme yes. than Ted Trainer, and I happen to believe that he is closer to the truth. Yeah, yeah. Well, usually the extreme people are. <laughs> yes. And the solution in one of Nate Hagen's papers, which is called, let me try to recall the title of it, uh, it's called the superorganism. Yes. And uh, I can send you a full link to it. Okay. But it's a paper which analyzes human history as being driven not by science but by narrative. Yes, 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 yes. Narrative as uh, promoted by art on the cave walls, by churches in the medieval area. Yeah, yeah by the uh, colonizing efforts of the Brits are the worst, but, you know, the Spanish and Portuguese before them. All of these efforts are part of the way the human brain thinks. Yeah, 
Well, and science is against how the human human brain says. Yeah, it should be. Yes. Well, no, no. It, it, we should be driven by science, yes, but exactly. we are driven by narrative. Yes, and and part of that is uh, I saw some comment yesterday. They were talking about the EU and how everything is predicated about uh, desired outcomes, and everything exists on PowerPoints, but they never really say yeah, yeah, how they're going right. to get there. That's right. And the IPCC is as bad as yes. anyone else. Yes. Oh, yes. Now, I wrote a private official information request to the Climate Change Commission after there was a newsroom article on wind generation advocating offshore wind turbines. Yes, yes. In comparison to onshore wind yes, turbines. Yes. And I made a single simple request. Would you please find an analyst who can give a credible assessment of the EROI, that's the energy yes, return yes. on energy invested, of those two technologies. Please compare offshore with onshore yes, wind. Yes, yes, yes. And what was the result? Uh, wait for 27 days. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's always a wait. wait and then and wait see. another 27 days. Yes, <laughs> yes, and never get it. No. So I have challenged them on EROI. Yes. But I believe the superorganism is a good description of how American, uh, so of how the human species yes is developing its civilizations. Yes. And uh, so that's the description. That, I believe, is what's happening. And uh, Nate Hagens says that he believes civilization will collapse. Yes. Civilization as we know will collapse. Yeah, yeah, it's well on its way. Yes. And he says the best help we can do is to develop islands of coherence yes. within a collapsing society. Yes, yes. And he quotes Ilya Prigozhin, yes, yes. Oh, yes. who, by the way, is part of my scientific. He was a thermodynamicist yes. who was regularly quoted by my PhD advisor. Wow. So Prigogine was part of my understanding yes. of how thermodynamics really drives all things, including ecology yes. and even economic development. Yes. So really we're moving in a completely um, wrong direction. We should be localised. We should be looking at how That's we right. localise electricity, energy production yep. and not making, not thinking big, you know. Yep. And that's exactly what I advocate, and I'm openly advocating it to all sorts what of groups. What I didn't know about was this uh, project at Lake Onslow. Can you oh, tell yeah. me what that's about? Oh, yes. <laughs> it is uh, something very similar to Manipuri. <laughs> it is an area which is high above the Clutha River. Yes. It's an almost empty landscape, which used to be a wetland, yes. but got drowned when somebody wanted to put a little power scheme. Yeah. So there's a little lake there now. But it is in the lowest rainfall region of the whole country, Good God. in central Otago. And now it runs two or three very useful little small power stations. But it's a big basin. Yes. And it is based on schist rock. On what? Schist, which uh, is uh, a very can you spell hard. That? S C H I S T. Okay. Yes. It's based on schist, which is very non-erodible. Yes. So if they were to build a two or three hundred foot high dam right there in central Otago. It would probably not erode the shorelines, yes. and therefore it means that they could pump the water up and down without causing people to complain. Right. 
of uh, of big big muddy flats. Yeah, and yeah. That's about being able to store surplus water. Yes. Kind of plentiful rainfall. And exactly. When the levels are low. Yeah. There's only one thing that's hard about this idea. They will have to pay for every kilowatt hour they store. Yeah. Pay who? Meridian or whoever runs the Manipuri. Right. And they Meridian and Contact. They being whoever pays for this wonderful storage scheme, so see, which is probably that, government. That, that awful dilemma of having it's a stup- yeah yeah uh, energy providers, and we're at the whim of the yeah of any kind of. But you see, government's on side because they're a fifty percent owner. Yeah, yeah, and it comes back to the principle of uh, so. Uh, uh, capitalism for the poor and socialism for the rich. That's right. <laughs> yeah. We socialise costs and privatise profits. Yeah. So what you, from what you've said, Molly, I'm looking oh. at... Yes? Sorry, Ron, I'm yes. Sort of, uh, there aren't too many etiological problems that you would see associated with that. Well, there's. it was an important wetland, and it still is important. There are probably rare species that they don't even know. And it is a whole ecology which is fairly unique so yes there are ecological problems thank you i'll back out now Robin. Yeah, no, that's all right. so that brings me back to the article that you showed me uh and and your response yes. to which you hadn't yet got a reply yes. can, can you tell me a little bit about that well uh the the newsroom article is expresses sadness that there is no consumer representation. Yes. I am saying it is no surprise because consumer re- representatives would say you should not raise power prices to build big yes. assets that you don't need. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and that's all I was saying. Yes, yes. So it relates to just what we were talking about yeah, before. Yeah. The yeah, industry yeah. wants green growth. Government wants green growth because that's economic growth. Any form of economic growth yes. they will have. So they're and really saying, we want growth, but it's probably better that it's green growth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and in fact, uh, we must have degrowth if civilization yeah. is going to survive as yeah. we know it. Yeah. And increasingly, it is getting to the point where civilization will not survive. Yeah. Period. And the best we can hope for is to create islands of coherence within a collapsing society. And I am doing everything I can, Robin, mm. to create islands of coherence. Fantastic. Yes. That's my I th- I think we're at job one on my last two decades. Yes. Will be to create that island of coherence. Yes, yes. Well, that's all we can do, isn't it? That's right. Yes. And try to have more and more people understand that this can work that there are ways to live a good life, indeed a socially complex and interesting life, within a localized economy, which grows most of its own food, but in particular grows its own energy. And the mechanism that I'm now proposing is extraordinarily hopeful in that we, I propose to repeat the ecology of the Carboniferous era in which trees are so aggressive that they grow as tall as they possibly can, as close together as they possibly can, and we end up with forests, which are enormously large forests, right within the city. The first time I ever heard you, uh, I think, was on Radio New Zealand, and you used to appear uh, quite regularly Indeed. on Radio New Zealand. Indeed. So I'd just like to ask as an introduction how you came to all of this, and 
Ah. Came to be a well, I won't say expert in the electricity market. Well, it it was all about married and come to New Zealand. I was doing a PhD in what I used to call molecular sociology, which is how molecules get along with each other yes. within the cell. Yes. And the molecule I was studying was DNA. And I was doing it with experimental work measuring its viscosity under certain conditions. Requires very precise experimental work, which I enjoyed. Yes. But uh, I had met a person who worked in the lab, Hugh Mellish, who was working on photochemistry and really the chemistry of light. Photochemistry. Is it? Photo. Oh, photochemistry. <clears throat> chemistry of, of light yes, particles, yes. of oh, photons. Yes. <clears throat> and in the end, our love superseded any any effort to, to go for a doctorate. <laughs> and it was married and come to New Zealand. Right. <laughs> that was in 1963. And we were married in the lab, in the home of my research director. So he really supported, because he knew Hugh too. And he supported my marriage. And we had a lovely marriage in his home. And then went to New Zealand. And we, I had two children, two babies here in New Zealand, and I had to learn how to be a housewife and a mother because I had no family at all to guide me. Hugh's uh, four siblings lived in various places, not very close by, but not far, and they... But it was a different, Hugh and I were different, yeah. and we just found our own way. In fact, the people we felt closest to were his uh, his mother's cousins who lived in York Bay. Yeah. We were able to get a flat in York Bay, uh, and within a year we were able to buy a section in York Bay, and we built our house built by the Anchor Homes, which was the people who used to, the biggest builder in Wainui Amata. Yeah. And they came around the corner and, and built our house. So I was very happy as a young mother. And uh, we, Hugh and I walked all the time in the bush in York Bay. Uh, but I had to go before my work so my work, my PhD was going to be in, in statistical thermodynamics, yes. is the name for it. But I called it molecular sociology, yeah, right. how <laughs> molecules get yeah. along together. But before that, in 1956, I took a course in bioecology at Connecticut College for Women, which was very close to Yale University. Now, Yale had some of the most forward-looking ecological research ever, and still do. And I took bioecology with people who had been at Yale and were deeply into proper experimental ecology, supported by statistical and supported by mapping and, you know, really, really professional ecology. So I never recovered from that course. I was, deep down, I was an ecologist yes, yes, yes. all my life. And we quickly learned the native plants. We stole native plant seedlings and grew them on our section, which was south-facing and natural for growing back bush anyway. Yeah. And those trees are now 50, 55 years old, wow. almost 60 years old. Yeah. And it's been a, you know, it's been so a So where did the, where did the uh, uh, electricity, electricity come in? Electricity came in, and just Pam was involved, because I did a, a submission to the Nature Conservation Council. Yes. Yeah. Uh, supporting native forestry 
and opposing uh, conversion of native forest to pine. Yeah, yeah, right. And to do that submission, I went to the Forest Service Library to find out all about how pine works in yeah. New Zealand. And it had been thought that pine made soils acid. Turned out they didn't. Yeah. The beech trees are make a much more acid soil than the pine. Yeah. Never mind. Uh, pine is still a monoculture yeah. and still wrong. People were then predicting that the second crop or the, or the third crop of pine would not be as vigorous as the first. In a way, this hasn't been proven because the, they're getting so many varieties that the new pines grow faster and taller than the old varieties. But they're more subject to disease. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> disease is going to kill their plants sooner or later. And if not, the erosion yes. is sure to kill the pines. So, yes. so I believe that pines are still completely wrong yes. for New Zealand. We should be growing the native species for timber, but also for energy. Yes, yes. And that's what I'm now beginning to move into so many years after I got known. Anyway, so I did the submission to Nature Conservation Council. I then got invited to join the Forestry Working Party yeah. on uh, planning for extensively increasing pine. And on the Working Party, I took a different Yes. In fact, I wrote a dissenting opinion yes. <laughs> to their big report. And in my dissenting opinion, I said, this monoculture is going to catch us in the end. It's yes. no good. Yes. So, uh, but then I found out that the uh, government was going to encourage, by, you know, they owned the whole electricity system. Yes. They were going to almost double their power generation in order to fund the pulp mills, which were planned. And so I got onto the power planning committee. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and that's, that's where I started my okay. electricity work. <laughs> and I criticized the power planning committee. You better believe I criticized them. But to do, then the Royal Commission for Nuclear Power came came up, and it was the Royal Commission for Nuclear Power, and I criticized that, and um. I did analyses supported by Hugh, who had just gotten bought an HP hand calculator, which was able to do statistical analysis just with the press of a few buttons. And we took the power generation trends and the funding and all sorts of trends, and we analyzed them. What is it going to cost to follow this trend which was predicted? And uh, so we figured it out on the calculator the uh, they were pro proposing originally seven and a half percent per year growth of power generation, and the Burns Committee brought that down to six point eight percent growth. And I did all these analyses, did the graphs accordingly and predicted that no more than 2% per year growth was feasible. And I remember, uh, and we knew that they wouldn't accept uh, so something done just on an HP hand calculator. So we talked somebody in the university to do exactly the same calculation. <laughs> but now on university paper to yeah, prove yeah. that 2% growth was, that the very last, most recent year, it was only 2%, and I predicted that 2% growth would continue. Yeah. 
no more. And I remember standing with quaking knees. Uh, as it happened, the uh, printing system went down. He could not pu- print the graphs, so he had to dump the entire output of his program. And I had to stand with this dump and say the operations research at Vic University has predicted that uh, following trends in a sensible way, we would have no more than 2% growth. And I had circled the things that added up to 2%. Uh-huh. And uh, anyway, I was right, of course. How wonderful. It was 2% for growth. For you, did they no, no. Yeah, of course they hadn't listened. Yeah. <clears throat> but the person who supported it, I, a little guy called Ed somebody, was very sympathetic to my argument. <clears throat> and he managed to get something into the appendix, uh, which said something about what I said. But he was most sympathetic, but the uh, commission itself dead against it. But I was right. All the time. Oh, I, I just had one other thing. Uh, just while we were sitting here, um, you started, well, we both started talking about the uh, the debt economy and how this is following oh, yes. all of this. Can you just repeat those, uh, those comments? So this is a point that's been made in several several articles by maybe three or four different research people and organizations to say that the growth economy is invariably funded by debt. (laughs) That's the way everything is funded now. And uh, in order to raise more capital to go out and do more oil exploration, You have to fund it by debt. And uh, you have to build, if you want to increase your asset growth, you need to, uh, basically the the capitalist system is uh, aims for growth and it creates growth by tying resources to debt and by debt funding the development of the resources. Now, I cannot explain it in its full simplicity Mm. because I'm not familiar enough yet with the literature, but that's the conclusion, that that the growth economy is driven by debt, and the more we grow, the more debt we uh, incur. And sooner or later... There won't be enough resources to because our uh, interest on capital and the the system so money represents resources, real resources in the ground, yes. and in particular represents energy. Yes. And we if we want to acquire more energy. Yes. We have to raise enough money yes. to build the new power stations yes, or yes. the new offshore rigs. Yeah, yeah. And sooner or later, since the system is unreal, mm. completely unreal, sooner or later we won't have the energy. Yeah. And it is EROI, yeah. which could be analyzed right now and produce obvious results. But there may be uh, people are ge- geopolitical to aspects that come into play that bring this to an end. Could be. <coughs> a lot of this is based on the petrodollar, is it not? That's right. Okay. <coughs> so a little bit more about my history. <coughs> So I did the submission to the Royal Commission. I was right all the time. And for my labors, I was invited... Oh, for my submission to the Royal Commission, 
on nuclear power. I made a bunch of interviews with the both the power station builders at what was then NZED, Electricity Department, <coughs> and with the power forecasters, mm. a guy named Dave Cook. It took me 11 tries to get an appointment with Dave Cook. Mm -hmm. He did not want to talk to me. Yeah, yeah. But I stuck with it. <coughs> In the end, I talked with him, and I got him to get some data from his official the the center of data collection was up in the Waikato and he got his official guys to send me some graphs and I calculated everything I wanted to know what was the lowest that the demand would sink to in the middle of the night yeah. in summer yeah. That was a bit of data that I needed. Yeah. And in the end, the data showed that the lowest demand ever was 100 megawatts. And I said, but what's using that 100 megawatts? He had no idea. Yeah, yeah. Wow. He was a an economist and a forecaster, not an engineer. He yeah. had no idea. Yeah, yeah. It turned out that transformers just sitting there use up power. Yeah. He didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I found his missing 100 megawatts. And from then on, he respected my understanding of science. Yeah. And I was then invited on to various working groups, which had to do with what to do about growing electricity demand. Yeah. So I was on one after another working group within the electricity industry, right through the 80s, right through the 90s, and in through till about 2010. Yes. But I didn't agree with the basis for which the working groups were working. So what happened after 2010? I got turfed off. Yes, because you didn't fit I into their go paradigm. Along. Yep. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. What's the economic model? Hmm. The necessity for growth. Yeah. It seems that I mean you know I mean with the you know with the. Uh, Neoliberal reforms of you know after 1984, you know I mean a lot of people were chucked out of their positions and everything. But the, it, it 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 seems as though there's even less interest in listening to anybody than ever before. You know. Mm -hmm. True. The neoliberal model gives all power to the corporates. And they set up whatever the market they like, which takes power away from consumers. And if you look at nature, there's a, there's a, a lot of food balance between and consumers. And when that gets tipped over, either on one end or the other, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. To have an ecosystem. Oh, you take out all your consumers. And when an ecosystem fails, <coughs> you get desert. That's right. So it's not that different, really, is it? You lose the water cycle, you lose the carbon cycle. Well, we're losing that now, Molly. That is terrifying. Mm. Yeah. I mean, the climate system it is broken. Yes. Breaking every seven. Oh, you're talking about microflora. I was at one day. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I thought. Uh, but that's okay. Oh, now what were you? Oh, I was just, oh, I was just making an analogy between the broken, the gross economic model, and I was mm. saying, you know, if you take nature, you've got a balance between in a natural ecosystem. I can think about people between say and the sea. You've got your producers, your primary producers, yeah. and the second being you've got your consumers, right up to your big ships. But if if that change. Yeah. Or if the connectedness is damaged or broken, yep. then the ecosystem 
soon will they yeah. fall apart. Yep. And that's the ecology of God given. And, and I know that so well from my, my understanding of natural systems. Yeah. Yeah. But I've never thought of that before when I think about economics. But it's not oh, that different. different. Very yeah. similar. So, and and I actually find the term consumers. I find it very demeaning. It is. I am a consumer. And that's but all you are. You're a lot more than a consumer. I'm a consumer of mental. Oh, I don't. I, very fortunate, I'm not, but I'm a consumer of mental health <laughs> if, if, if I needed that. Or I'm a consumer yeah. of um, a, a, a reti- you know, I'm a consumer of a superannuation benefit, mm-hmm. which could be used for something else if I wasn't here. I'm a useless well, benefit, and that's the I mean, Molly, this is terrible. This and it's the way that, it's going. Yeah, and it's the language yeah, it's of written. infinite it's growth, really isn't it? Dangerous. It's really dangerous. It's really very dehumanising. Yeah. It's it really, is, really course. dehumanising. Of course. Well, in the growth, um, in the growth, right. in the growth model, you don't, you don't need human beings. You need <laughs> consumers. Yeah. That's right. And oh. that is why <coughs> I have this vision of islands of coherence. Yes. Right, and I want to build it. Is that your term? No, it's Ilya Prigogine. Oh, right. right. Who was a thermodynamicist. That's a beautiful term. Specialising in chaos. Wow. He started wow. chaos theory. So he's a physicist? He's a thermodynamicist. Wow. Physical, wow. A physical chemist like me. And, and it's islands of, of, what's the term again? Coherence. That's that a brilliant term, yes. That is yes. marvellous. Have you got that? Huh? Islands of coherence. It is, it is, it is completely what it says it is. Mm. It's what it says it is. And we must And we can do it. Yes. Yeah. We can do it. And we already a, have it. So started. it's totally, it's totally realistic. You know, mm. you can just go out and all you need to do is persuade a few people. You can do it yourself. Or do it yourself. Right. You, you can, can do, do it at home. home. Yes, well, we've but sort of got a little island of coherence here, I think. We have. <laughs> you are. You are. Yep. You know, we have yeah. actually. Yes, because my original version, when we, um, you know, because this was just after 2008 and with transition towns, was, you know, if you could get um, your neighbours all involved and, you know, say, well, you can't grow everything in a um, in a, in a backyard, so why don't you grow this? That's right. We'll grow that. That's right. But instead, instead of that, everyone put up uh, big high fences. Yeah, I know it's sad, isn't it? Yeah.